So I really heard first about being selected as the winner of the Ogawa Yamanaka Award, getting a phone call from San Francisco from Dibak Srivastava, and I was obviously very surprised because I was not even aware of the fact that I'm even nominated, let alone being the actual winner of the award. So it was an amazing surprise and amazing honor to be really be selected for this award. My, my team has really worked for quite a long time on strategies to take reprogrammed cells, such as cells you can obtain now from any individual by just simply using this ama amazing Yamanaka technique by reprogramming the cells back to iPS cells. We can take those iPS cells and coax them to become different cell types. We have made a recipe by now that allows us to get more than 50 different distinct cell types generated in such a way. For example, cell types that would be relevant for the study of Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, but also we were particularly interested in disease of the peripheral nervous system. For example, uh, a system that has been studied less is the system that exists in your gut, that is the so-called enteric nervous system that controls uh, how your uh, colon, for example, uh, the properly uh, performs peristaltic movements, how you secrete factors, and again, something that can go often wrong. Many, many people suffer from diseases related to their gastrointestinal system, and there are genetic disorders where this is a very acute problem. Now, in all those cases, we have been able to make either cells of the peripheral or the central nervous system, and then use those cells in the context of modeling a disease in a dish. So what that means is we make the cells either from the patient directly, so it has the same DNA as the patient that gave us the blood or the fibroblast cell. And then we can study really what goes wrong in this process because we understand very well how these cells normally develop. Mm -hmm. We can see in the patient's context what goes wrong during the disease and develop new models that allow us to understand the mechanism of the disease. But also we can make millions and billions of those cells. So it's now possible quite routinely to then screen thousands of drugs against whatever goes wrong in this disease. And so we're quite excited that we had a number of examples where we found new potential therapeutic compounds that can now actually now be tested in the patients that suffer from that disorder. And so we put a lot of effort onto what we would call disease modeling, capture the disease in a dish, and using it to understand the disease or to potentially treat the disease with novel drugs. In parallel, because again, we can make cells at very large scale, we are also pushing very hard forward using such reprogrammed cells for actually replacing cells lost in the disease. So in this case, it's the cell not just simply a model of the disease, but the cell is the drug itself. So we want to actually replace tissues lost in disease. And we did that, for example, very uh, intensely for the last decade or more in the context of Parkinson's disease. That's an area where we hope to get very close to the clinic. We have done a lot, a lot of the legwork. We've produced many literally billions of cells by now, have done a lot of animal studies, and we are very, very close to really making that last step for a first in human trial. But also other disorder, I quickly mentioned this system in your gut, the enteric nervous system. There are children in the world, it's a relatively rare condition called Hirschsprung disease, but there are some of those children have this disease in a very, very severe form where we cannot really help them medically or surgically at this stage. And we hope in the future we'll be able, similar to what we developed with Parkinson's over the last decade, we can take the same paradigm and do that for this enteric nervous system cells, replace a large part of the enteric nervous system and give those kids a new chance for life. And so these are some of the areas really that we try to push forward in our lab. And I think it's obviously many, many diseases that need new treatments. And I think where we try to place ourselves is really kind of as a problem solver. So there are often bottlenecks, like in the case of Parkinson's disease, there was a period of about eight years where the whole field just didn't know how to get to the right cell. And so it took us a lot of insight. We had to go back very deep, be very persistent, and figuring out what's the deep developmental biology, how are these cells really generated. And once we understood that well enough, suddenly we could make cells that not only would look good in a dish, but now actually would start to work in a mouse model, in a rat model, or in a monkey model of Parkinson's disease. And so it needed really these deep developmental insights. Those studies using fetal cells in the 80s, they were very informative in many ways, even so they are considered to some extent a failure because they never really developed into a usable therapy for many patients. But they told us fundamentally that this approach can work even with fetal cells because yes, only in a small proportion of patients, 
But in about 20% of the patient, those fetal cells actually would take properly and they would survive for at least 15, 20 years. And in some of those patients, it seemed to have worked to an extent where the patient did not need to take any L-DOPA medication, which is the most commonly used medication in Parkinson's disease, 15, 20 years later. And that's nearly unheard of. The problem is obviously, why did it work only in 20% of the patient? You don't want to have something that really doesn't work in the majority of people. And we don't know the answer for sure, but we learned a lot, again, by going back and looking at those studies, both with regard to selecting the patients more properly that might have the best benefit, but also in the past using fetal cells, it was really not possible to properly dose and standardize the cells. I think of stem cell-based therapy a little bit more like a drug. So when you have a drug, you know exactly what's in your vial. You know how much of each compound. If you have multiple compounds, you can exactly define what's in it. With fetal cells, it was just a gamish of cells, which was very poorly understood. Now with the cells coming from stem cells, we've spent a lot of time optimizing that and really having it at the level of precision that you would think, again, you need in drug development and you can make it in very large numbers. So you have consistently exactly the same cells again and again. And therefore the variability of the treatment should go down dramatically. So we think it's still relying on some of the ideas that were really there two decades before, but now we actually know how to do it properly because we can make only the cells that we think are efficacious and we can avoid the cells that we think are problematic. And for example, some of the side effects that this patient suffered from, even though it's not 100% in detail clear all how that works mechanistically, but at least some of the cells that are likely the culprit of the side effects, we can completely eliminate in our stem cell based approach because no longer this gamish, it's actually a defined cell type. And I think that's the way to go forward. And even if the first effort were not to work perfectly, we can at least now really fine tune. We not just have, a, again, this kind of undefined product that every time you need to freshly make, but we can very precisely engineer the cell that's most efficacious. And I think that is what gets me excited in the approach. It's much more targeted that we can now really optimize in a systematic way. We can dose it, we can distribute the cells more broadly and really see what is the strategy that benefits best the patient without really having any major risk of side effects. And now we're at the stage where really the very, very final studies are progressing. In fact, this month and next month, we're gonna hear the final result from those studies that are so-called IND enabling studies. And so, again, we did a lot of discussions with the FDA before, but if those studies are all positive the way we hope, we should be able to file for our IND early next year and really start the trial maybe mid-2018. Now again, barring any unforeseen surprises, but it's a very exciting time to really get to the stage to actually move forward.